Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new year with AI Colorado. We're so glad you're here today to join us for a very special conversation. We're kicking off our virtual connect series this year with a topic that's unfortunately very timely. It's on disaster relief, Boulder County fire recovery resources. Once again, I'm Mike Waldinger, your CEO for AI Colorado. We closed out another challenging year with a bit of uh, some bad news for folks affected by this uh, Marshall Fire and the Middle Fork fires. Those burned more than 6,000 acres and 1,200 homes and businesses were affected in less than a 24 hour period. Um, it was wildfires are certainly not unique in the state of Colorado, but this one was a uh, one that took us all by surprise in its ferocity, its uh, quickness as it consumed these homes and the kind of urban area that it affected more so than others that have been uh, in our past. So today we're gonna to be discussing the architect's role in recovery and resources available in our community. We've got a really strong panel uh, assembled for you today. Most importantly, we have the folks who are dealing with this uh, day in and day out and have been since the, the disaster kicked off. So we're very grateful for their time as much as anyone else's. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing those local folks who are, who are taking time out of their schedule and wanna thank them uh, with their time being so precious uh, and being pulled in a thousand different directions to try and figure out um, how to service their community that's really in need right now. We're going to start with um, Dale Case. Dale is the director of Boulder County Community Planning and Permitting. Uh, Dale, thank you for joining us. And then also with Dale, we have Ron Flax. Ron is a lead accredited professional and is the chief building official and deputy director for Boulder County. Hi, Ron. Hello. And then finally, also from Boulder County, we have Kimberly Sanchez. Uh, Kimberly Sanchez is an ESF 14 damage assessment lead. Uh, I'm sure that's come in handy lately. And also the deputy director at Boulder County Community Planning and Permitting. Welcome, Kimberly. Hello, thanks for having us. We're gonna start with the three of them, but I also wanna introduce our other panelists so you can see and hear from them as well. Um, first up, we're really glad to have uh, a longtime friend of ours from AI Colorado and a former colleague in AI national leadership, Julia Donahoe, AIA Esquire. Um, she's an architect and an attorney. She's the co-founder and CEO of Policyholder Technologies Inc. And their mission is to provide a one-stop shop for all policyholder needs after a disaster. She hails from California and it's great to see you again, Julia. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I actually was in Colorado for about a decade building in Pagosa Springs, so uh, it's an area dear to my heart. Glad to have you. And we also have Kevin Keedy. Kevin Keedy is an AIA member and lead accredited professional. He's the vice president managing principal at AECOM. Uh, AECOM has a lot of experience in disaster response. They've worked in large scale partnerships uh, with FEMA and the US Army Corps of Engineers and other government agencies and nonprofits in this arena. So we're glad to hear your perspective today as someone who is, is close to us, but also works across the nation on these responses. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Mike. And finally, our very own Nicholas Remus. He's an architect and AI Colorado Advocacy Engagement Director. Nick and I will join the discussion uh, as it continues today to help identify opportunities for AI to assist. And Nick is our staff liaison to the disaster assistance team. Uh, both nationally and here in AI Colorado. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so I think what everybody wants to know is what is going on and how are you coping in Boulder County? So uh, between uh, Dale, Ron, and Kimberly, uh, why don't we start by turning over the floor with you? And again, we, we, aren't, we will have some more formal presentation and comments and question and answer at the end of these uh, conversations, but really that's what we want to start with is a dialogue uh, with you in the middle of what you're dealing with and this audience of architects who are, who are caring and concerned and interested in, and able to help, what message would you like to share with us? Uh, how can you bring us up to speed and, and get this kicked off today? Yeah, good morning. I, I'll, I'll start and I'm Dale Case. And thanks for inviting us here this morning. And we, do, we really do appreciate the interest uh, that this organization, this group has shown and reaching out to us and reaching out to Kim to get this set up. Uh, it's so important to establish these dialogues early to understand the issues. As, as I think you said, Mike, it, right now it's pulling us in, in a bunch of different directions. Um, you mentioned Kim as head of damage assessment. So it, and a tremendous effort done by the county teams with the city, in coordination with the cities in this case to assess the damage, get those numbers that you were reading. Um, 
it's heartbreaking to to just see the numbers, to be out in the field, to see what's happened to people. And staff is here and the county is here really prepared to, to help and to try to get people back in as soon as we can and get them back in in a way that is um, hopefully an improvement over, over the past built environment. So, um, you know, these things are, are opportunities for us to, to keep moving forward in how we address the built environment, how we address the interactions between climate change and human and, and, and what we do as humans. So um, trying to figure out how do we do that? How do we move forward in a way that um, is both recognizing people's want and need and our want and need to have them back as a community? Because that's that's what we're here for. Um, at the same time, to do it in a way that that they're taking advantage of changes in technology and changes in our knowledge about these things as we move forward. So um, it's, a, it's a balance as we move forward on those things, as we look to see how we can, um, how we can get people back in in a way that um, it is under the current codes, that we can incentivize and provide information and education for them to take advantage of doing things differently, potentially, as far as energy efficiency or um, how they um, site their their home on their lot or uh, moving to electrification, any of those, those issues that we want to hear what, what your thoughts and ideas are, what you, what you're experiencing out there, um, what you've um, experienced if you've been involved in other disasters. Um, and then also any suggestions you have as far as us and our process. Many of you have worked with us through our processes in the past ideas for, for us to make those processes efficient as possible. We, need, we know we need to bring on extra staff to be able to handle this demand. We usually do about 60 or 70 new single family homes a year total in the unincorporated part of the county. And so uh, when we're looking at this, we're looking at you know, a couple hundred destroyed or damaged structures that we know are gonna be coming in for permits over the next several years. And so that adds greatly to our, our, our workload and staff and staff needs. And we have to understand how to resource things as we move forward. So that's my nutshell. Kim's in this in the day to day in the trenches. She can give you an update on all the situational awareness and where things stand um, because she knows more than I do as of this morning. So thanks. And we're here for questions and comments. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate that overview. And, and that's those 60 to 70 homes annually in the unincorporated area don't take into account all the other uh, permitting and plan review processes that you're doing um, in the current yeah. areas. So that's just a small slice of what you're, you're dealing with. Yeah, we've, we've, we've been dealing with about upwards of 3000 building permits a year. Um, whereas four years ago we were around 2000 or 1800. So just a huge increase in, in that anyways. And this will add to, to all that. Yeah, and, and the rest of those projects haven't stopped. In fact, they're probably uh, continuing to go on an upward trajectory. So yeah. um, our, our thoughts are with you as you go through all this. And if you could remind us all, um, so the codes that will be, that are in place, that will continue to be in place. Um, so the codes are, um, you know, our, our, our land use code for zoning purposes and then our, our current building code and Ron correct me if I get this wrong is the 2015 international yeah. codes where are the 2015 our local amendments so so our energy efficiency requirements are uh, considerably more stringent than what's in the base 2015 code but we are on the, the 2015 code with uh, with amendments okay so you're the 2015 I codes you know except for that energy which goes a little bit beyond that correct okay. Thanks. And um, Kimberly, why don't you um, share some of the things you've seen and, and the challenges ahead from your perspective? Um, thank you. I think Dale covered sort of where we're at right now. And um, really, we, we thank you for holding this forum because we're really interested in hearing some of your ideas and things that have worked well in the past or maybe not so well that we might be able to improve upon for this process. Um, one thing I did want to add to what Dale said is that I, I feel like there's been, at least from the architects and builders that I've talked to, some anxiety about sort of getting a place in line, knowing that we have such um, high demands already. Um, I do want to assure people that we do plan on um, dealing with 
this impacted community as a separate subset of the work that we do. And that's why we will be looking at, you know, what staff we need to add on into our existing resources or how do we backfill, um, you know, some of the existing um, duties and responsibilities that we already have ongoing and that we'll need to continue um, moving forward. But um, insofar as timing, I think, you know, people don't need to try to get a pre-app as soon as they can, knowing that they, they may not be able to get a pre-application conference for several months. We don't need people to get on our um, submittal schedule. We really wanna be dealing with the um, Marshall Fire rebuilds and damage as, a, as its own sort of group of people that we will be assisting um, outside of the, um, the regular um, process that is in place. And so, you know, a lot of those questions still need policy direction. And we're discussing now by looking at, you know, what is it that has been impacted in the 156 structures that have been destroyed? How many of those have had a previous site plan review? How many of those, um, you know, had building permits and what years were those building permits issued? We're, we're doing that analysis of um, what it is that was lost in the Marshall Fire community in the hopes that it can help inform us on you know, how to, to best go about um, a really expedited and sort of streamlined process to get people um, back into the community as, as quickly as we, can, as we can help them. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to offer any uh, you know, knowledge about what's been going on with damage assessment, essentially, you know, we've been working really heavily, we're still in response mode. So, you know, we haven't quite transitioned into like official recovery, although of course that's on all of our minds and um, response really helps lay the groundwork for our recovery efforts. Um, but we're still very much deep in damage assessment at this point. So we've gotten most of the resident, residential and commercial damage assessment done. We're still getting lots of self-reported damage that we need to go out and verify in each respected community, um, respective community, both respected and respective, but that's what I meant. And then um, right now, this week, we've been working on the open space and um, infrastructure damage assessment, um, mostly supporting both Superior and Louisville as those communities have um, much smaller staffs and haven't um, been able to have you know, for better or for worse, they haven't had a lot of the experiences that Boulder County has had in, in responding to disasters such as, you know, the Four Mile Fire, Cowwood Fire, um, 2013 flood. So we've really been lending our support and assistance in an overall coordinated effort to, to get a lot of those things done for, um, mostly for our funding and assistance that we'll get from the state and FEMA. Has that had to be in a, in a more formal fashion, like through mutual aid agreements, or or that's just something you do as a matter of course, and those those relationships already exist. Both. Yeah. 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 Um, what's been great right now, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the software called Crisis Track, but we've really we've gotten, you know, we had this incredible effort of building inspectors from all around the Front Range and Metro area volunteer to help um, do our initial damage assessment. Um, which took place kind of last Monday through Wednesday, primarily. And because we had so many teams of people out in the field, we were really able to um, complete those damage assessment inspections, the more detailed, you know, filling out the FEMA form and um, getting the photos taken and all of that documented um, in a matter of days, which was pretty outstanding. Um, I think we did over 2,700 inspections in a matter of three days. And that was including, you know, looking at debris, the assessors group going out and looking at them and our own building inspectors from various municipalities um, going out in a joint effort to do detailed damage assessment. We use this software called Crisis Track. And so everybody is going out with a mobile device and it geocodes where you are. You're able to take pictures. We download that all into one um, common set of software and it really helps us with our reporting to um, the state and FEMA. So it's been very slick and efficient to have that once we can get um, you know, the, the folks trained on, on how to use that software. Yeah, that's a game changer because having, having the people is, is a huge blessing, but if you don't have the tools to, 
to put them to work effectively. It's it's not that not that much of a uh, a value add. I I go back to the days of Rover, which was you know somebody thought that's fantastic, but this sounds even more uh, more effective. Yeah, it's been really incredible how smoothly it's gone and just the the number of people that have offered, I mean, like yourselves in, in many different forums to, to come forward and, and really help facilitate um, wherever it is that they might be able to assist. Mm -hmm. Colorado is fortunate in that uh, we're one of the good Samaritan states uh, for those folks that do things like damage assessments. Um, it, as long as you are acting within your scope of professional credibility and expertise, and you are not receiving any compensation or even trying to get uh, future work, uh, and you're deployed by a unit of government in a disaster zone, uh, you're free from liability. Now, that's there's a lot of disclaimers I put on that, but those who've been trained to do that work know exactly how it goes, and we've got the resources to do that. And mostly in a situation like this, it'd be code officials that are dealing with this on a daily basis anyway. Um, but in a in a catastrophe that's you know has a much broader area or has a lot more ground to cover over an extended period of time, that's when your architects and engineers come in for that. So. Um, You'll be hearing more about that toward the end of our session today, how um, we can train you if that's something you're interested in doing as a volunteer. It, it really has been inspiring to see how many people have, have reached out to, uh, to help. Uh, it's, it's been from, from uh, design professionals from all over the state have been, have been offering their services and it's, it's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really wonderful to see. Yeah, anything else, Kimberly, at this point before we circle back to you? I think that's it for right now, and I'm um, happy to provide some more information a little bit later as well. I, I guess uh, just just to add a little bit. Um, so one of the things that that I really want to make sure we we hear is uh, that we're actually hearing all the questions that the design professionals have uh, about this process and moving forward. We we're working uh, really hard to come up with, um, you know, essentially you know frequently asked questions and and, and make sure we're. Uh, giving consideration to the right questions, um, but we want to make sure we're, we're really um, understanding what the needs are out there. So um, it's really, really helpful to have that feedback to help us understand uh, what are the what are the challenges ahead that we need to work on. So we will reserve um, some time at the back end of the program for that. Um, I think what we're going to hear in the next couple of presentations are things that will prompt even more of those questions. Once we get a sense of the, the arena of possibility of how other AIA chapters and architects and, and other affected areas have been able to mobilize. Um, Ron, you want to share anything else just you know, at this point about what you've experienced and, and what you're thinking of going forward? Sure. Yeah. One of the things that that's really um, been interesting about this is that, you know, we're, we're calling this a, a wildfire event, um, yet it took place entirely out of uh, what we traditionally consider our wildfire uh, one, uh, wildfire zone one. And um, I think that we need to we need to understand that and we need to, I think, respond to that uh, because, you know, we we um, some of the ignition resistant uh, construction details that we do require uh, in the forested regions of the county, um, we don't require in the plains. And um, some of those details would have uh, saved some of these homes. And um, I think that's a that's a reality that we have to we have to fully acknowledge uh, in moving forward. So, you know, we want to we want to make sure that we, we are learning from this. Uh, and unlike the forested regions, um, the fuel sources for uh, for this uh, was primarily grassland, which will reestablish itself pretty fully uh, in a year or two. Um, and so we don't even have that sort of honeymoon period that we sometimes have to have after a major forest fire where you know it takes 10 or 15 years for those fuels to reestablish. Um, right now, we're, we're in a situation where those fuels could be uh, reestablished relatively quickly. So um, I think it's really important that we we give serious consideration to, to some of those details. Um, fortunately, many of those details are not particularly uh, uh, onerous in terms of uh, difficulty or cost, um, but we need to be um, you know, careful. Obviously, you know, many of these folks, uh, in fact, most folks are gonna be in a situation of, of a real financial uh, deficit when it comes to rebuilding. And so um, what we're looking at now is, is you know, trying to identify 
um, sources of, of support for folks who are building back and specifically thinking about um, when we build back, we try to build back better. How do we, how do we um, um, create uh, ways that, that the increase improvements in energy efficiency or ignition resistance construction, um, we can accomplish those things without adding to the, uh, the burdens of, of the affected uh, homeowners. Well, that really speaks, Ron, to the, to the point Dale made at the outset about that balance of wanting to have more resilient and, and better infrastructure, and yet understanding that it's probably not going to be done through a mandate or a, or a uh, administrative process, but more an incentivized process. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone has uh, any interest in an unfunded mandate on these homeowners. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the wrong time for that approach. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ron. Uh, Julia. Um, yeah. We're going to turn it over to you now, and I, you've got a presentation you can share, and it's largely based on experience you've had um, in similar situations in the state of California, who, of course, is no stranger to dealing with the effects of where, where development meets the urban uh, interface with, with the wildlands. Um, so I've just been really gratified by what our counterparts in California have done. They've got a pretty robust program where they deal with not only helping those who are affected at the local government level, but also consumers, homeowners, um, providing resources to them. Sometimes it's as, as simple as just sitting down with an architect and asking some questions. It's almost a counseling role in a sense, uh, but there is some long-term things that, that you wanna set up so that it doesn't happen as negatively if it, if it should affect an area again, or that other government jurisdictions who haven't, who aren't in a crisis mode, who aren't in the response mode, can proactively start adopting as policy. So, Julia, um, I don't want to say anything more than that because I know you're going to say it much smarter and, and much more in depth. So, why don't you share with us some of the experience you've had in California? Okay, um, what I'd like to share today is um, a little uh, PowerPoint about some of the things we're trying to do in California to be prepared to deal with disasters and what we have done in in some of our chapters already. And uh, so without much further, I'll just uh, open that up. Um, and uh, let me turn it into a slideshow. Okay. Should now be there. Can y'all all see that? Can you hear me? All good. Yes. Okay. So this is just a, a toolkit we're making to show how AIA chapters can work effectively with uh, the local officials uh, before, during, and after a major disaster. Uh, the first thing I just want everybody to recognize, and you may have to move around your people or minimize your people, um, the, the five phases of disaster management. And we've had this in the national AI head, handbooks for a while, but we're really trying to orient towards uh, local chapters and how they can be effective. And readiness is the first thing. Response is uh, the immediate steps the first few days after disaster. Uh, recovery is the next several months after the disaster, all the planning and work to be done to figure out what are the next steps for this particular community. Then rebuilding um, obviously can be two, three, four, ten years, depending on how you how well you've done in the re response and recovery and understanding your problem and and planning planning your way forward. And then at the end, of course, review uh, uh, lessons learned, reporting out. We have a local uh, a California wide disaster area network, uh, so we want to report there. We're writing case studies, and then we have those. If you guys want to see them, I can definitely provide those to Mike, and he can distribute. Um, so uh, the other thing I want uh, everyone to understand is there is a timeline. Uh, oops, it went too far. The timeline of disaster management readiness is something that, that we should be doing in AIA chapters annually so that all every year you have a new board and everybody should be uh, up to speed on what you can do um, to be prepared in case it comes to your community. You don't know whose community is gonna come to, but you may need to help your ne neighboring community uh, the response is uh, when all the emergency personnel are there trying to get people to a place of safety and uh, temporary shelters and all of that. When, when those people disappear, response is over and, and then we go into recovery mode. So there's not a lot of time to do those uh, safety assessments. 
uh, it all has to be done very quickly. And that's why mostly they rely on government officials, building officials, um, uh, engineers uh, uh, that are already on staff uh, and already in the payroll because a lot of times FEMA is paying and, and all of those things. So it, it's, it's hard for architects to be involved unless it's a really big disaster like an earthquake, Northridge earthquake definitely used a lot of architects and engineers, usually pulling those from outside of the chapter to come in uh, that's organized by the state. So that's not really the local chapter organizing. The, the recovery period is really a period of months and that's where the, the local architects can all become involved. And uh, there's many ways to become involved and many ways to work with the officials. Of course, because the response is a government response, uh, all of the public is looking at the government and saying, how quickly can you get my permit? You're gonna be my, my um, delay, but really gov government doesn't build houses. So there's a pivot that has to happen to architects and contractors. And most of the people involved have never worked with architects and contractors. Uh, they might've done a remodel, uh, but very few of them have ever been involved with architects. So uh, getting the chapter out there and aware in the recovery process helps uh, uh, people understand the dynamics of the process and then the rebuilding. Uh, all your architects will be so busy during, during rebuilding, there won't be time to be doing those kinds of activities that you do during recovery. So it's a, a very, very special time, that recovery period. And then review is something that your future boards will need to go back and say, how did we do? And uh, can we write a case study about this? So we're making um, some, some checklists for people. If you're in that uh, annual readiness, these are the things you need to do. I'm gonna go through that part quickly. Then there's the response, which I think you guys are already through. So I'm just gonna go through that pretty quickly. Um, we have checklists, uh, make sure everybody in your chapter or your staff is safe then uh, reaching out to your local architects and uh, then reaching out to the local officials and, and trying to get in front of them, being part of the disaster, re uh, disaster recovery uh, uh, center. Uh, we had tables there in some of our disasters and we manned them with local architects so people could talk to an architect. We made them sign a waiver, of course, of liability. You're, just, you're not at actually entering a contract, you're just getting some advice. Um, so, uh, and then creating the, the disaster recovery committee was actually key for our, uh, our chapter. Uh, we met four times during that recovery period. Not really before too much and not really after because everyone was too busy. But this is, this is what response is, seeing the governor and already having a business card in hand and going up and saying, uh, we need more than two years for insurance recovery in this scale of disaster. This was 6,000 homes down in uh, the Tubbs County fire here in my community. Um, there's uh, Senator Feinstein and Governor Brown. Senator Kamala Harris was there as well. Um, but I went up to all of the officials in that room because I already knew them and uh, because I was ready and we had trained, we had done a previous disaster two years before. So I, I kind of knew the dynamics and uh, uh, getting in front of them and saying, we need three, four years. We don't need two, we need more. It's gonna take more to rebuild. The average, the average time to rebuild is five years. Uh, you can get 25% of the community. We wanted to exceed those standards. So during this first phase, uh, the pro bono assistance of volunteer architects is getting involved with the disaster center, doing workshops, groups, and one-on-one. -on -one. In the uh, next phases, then it's design and engineering and uh, also helping people uh, not be taken advantage by ruthless contractors. Um, coordinating with the community is outreach and awareness with politicians, with social media, with community groups, professional activities, uh, learning about disaster. A lot of uh, the chapter can put on a lot of learning things like uh, uh, heat affected concrete is one or building green, rebuilding green, rebuilding uh, fire resistively, those kinds of things, uh, rebuilding prefab. Uh, a lot of that stuff comes out of the work. Uh, we collaborated with our builders exchange and uh, the CSLB in uh, developing programs. And we also uh, put on a green expo. Um, so this recovery period is when we can engage with all these uh, different organizations. This is several months after the disaster. So this is your critical time. You've just entered it. You have the next several months to actually make a difference in, in how things go and how much of the recovery gets to move forward. The disaster recovery committee for your chapter or for your state is really uh, critical to, to have someone organizing 
uh, what things need to happen and for different uh, individuals to be participating in those things, then the community outreach uh, should start from the chapter and um, uh, go out into the community, promoting good design and resilient rebuilding. The, the one thing architects hope for in this moment is to design, design back better, not just build back better. Design back better, design back resilient, design uh, more hardened and uh, more energy efficient and sustainable. And uh, so this is the time to promote architects and then also educate your architects. So those are the three things that seem the most important for the next several months. In our community, we had we did everything by base camp. We only met in person four times. Uh, we did most of our meetings by base camp, and we we had these uh, eight different sections of people being interested in fire resilient rebuilding, uh, advocacy for policy changes at the legislative level. That was extremely effective, by the way. Uh, community outreach into uh, uh, the the homeowners. Uh, learning about housing and ADU. There was a big a big problem with the ADU being uh, uh, required by the governor that there's no more single family zoning in California at all. Everything is allowed to have a second unit, but no one was able to do it because the cities were becoming a, a block to, to getting it done and the fees were becoming uh, prohibitive. Uh, uh, professional knowledge, obviously we wanted to have more professional knowledge about uh, fire uh, uh, rebuilding, not not in a wildfire, but in a firestorm. A wildfire burns much uh, much lower temperature. Uh, a firestorm uh, takes the fuel of the houses and and creates a microclimate of tornadoes and other things, and it builds. It's much more furious. Uh, sustainability was really big for us. We did several green expos with a, a bunch of other people. Uh, this one would be important to the officials. We had a committee of uh, architects and engineers, local architects and engineers, working with the building officials to, to define what really permit things needed to happen for the rebuilding. Do you need someone on septic if they're close enough to sewer to connect, or is that a, a taking? Um, uh, do you um, do you need to uh, hire an outside entity to cover the number of permits you think that are going to come through? In our county, they, they uh, installed two uh, double wides and hired an outside planner and spent $7 million. And those guys sat there for months with nothing to do because they were only allowed to work on fire rebuild. And it was a big expense. Uh, uh, it was a response to the community saying, don't stop our permit, but nobody has a permit because they haven't done drawings and they haven't done engineering and they aren't uh, ready to go for a permit. So it takes a, a long time. So don't be in too much of a hurry to spend a lot of money uh, ramping up your permitting, but be aware that that there is a wave, and there are charts out there that you can find that shows where uh, where the wave is and when you will need need the extra staff. So so be mindful of that uh, before you go out and spend a lot of money on extra resources for permitting just for the wildfires in in Malibu and LA County. They didn't even uh, have extra resources. They just said, well, we'll give you some special attention and. Uh, in other places, they've had completely dedicated staff. So, so it's a fine line you need to figure it out for your community based on all of your workload. And also for architects, many architects, the main thing you need to know is stay in your lane and really take the time to evaluate what you can take on. Um, uh, the, the last thing on here was whole neighborhood rebuilding for our workforce housing uh, subdivisions that were wholesale destroyed. How do we get the most of that back? So that was my little baby. Uh, so that was interesting to me. Uh, one thing that architects need to be aware of during this period is don't over-design. Don't, uh, you need to, to build back a house that the insurance can actually pay for. Uh, some people had a 1,500 square foot house, but their architects sold them a 3,300 square foot one and the insurance wouldn't pay for it. So they spent a lot of money on, on fees that, that were unnecessary. Some architects and designers charged unreasonable fees and uh, didn't do proper estimating and, and left people out to dry uh, without uh, a year down the road with nothing, nothing to show for it. So, um, so be mindful that they're using this insurance money to pay for the design. So it's important you don't have to do your work for free, but you have to be reasonable on your fees and, and, and reasonable in the size of structure you're rebuilding. So don't over design for people. Uh, we did workshops. Uh, in person uh, in 2017, we were able to rent a big hall and architects came for two days and anybody could come in and sit down with an architect. Of course, we had them sign waivers that you could sit for 30 minutes or an hour with a one-on-one -on -one session with an architect. 
in Santa Cruz County during uh, COVID, they, they uh, had to do it by Zoom. Uh, so they had signups online. It was uh, very effective. I'll show you that afterwards and give you the contact for that person uh, who can help. This is what our workshop looked like uh, two years before in, in uh, Lake County, one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions. Uh, when we did it in the tub spire, we rented a much bigger hall and uh, we, we had people all spread out much better. But this was, uh, this developed the trust of authorities that were here to help and help people understand the process. People have never built a home themselves. They, this is all new to them and it's, it's going to take them years and they need to understand this isn't an overnight process. You don't get a permit overnight because you do have to design, you do have to go through all of this process. And the main thing during rebuilding is your architects are going to be so busy. Uh, if you can help homeowners connect to the right architect through, uh, we had an Excel page that was live and architects could post uh, what their capacity was and what they could help with. And uh, homeowners could go in and see the list of architects that were available to help with residential or commercial building. And they could more easily find someone who could actually help them rather than just a list of architects. Um, it was super helpful. Uh, so how we do that, how you do that with workshops and hotlines are important. Um, here's some examples. Oh, and then you also want to protect people from uh, fraudulent contractors. I, I'm an architect, attorney, and general contractor. So I get to see the front and back end of all of this. And uh, the back end is really dismal when you have uh, uh, really fraudulent contractors. And I've, I've seen a few and it's just like horrendous what happens to the homeowners. So um, these homeowners have never, never built a home. They have to enter 20 different contracts to, to get their home rebuilt. Um, they have to deal with appraisers, adjusters, geotech, surveyors, architects, engineers, title 24, they don't, they've never known, they don't know who the team leader is supposed to be. They all think, well, I better hire a contractor. But architects are really supposed to be the team leader a lot of the, the architects in, in our community ended up not doing uh, the CA and that ended up being not such a great thing. So I really encourage people to write contracts where they're still involved at some level with CA. When I was in Colorado, I always wrote in a certain number of site visits into my contract and it was prepaid so that there was no arguing about it later. Uh, so that's really something that's uh, wise to do. Um, but yeah, so these homeowners have never done it and they're suddenly having to do it. If you can understand the insurance, this is a little dashboard that I use to show what the insurance is paying on the left and then what, what it's really going to cost to rebuild your home. And then you can evaluate, are you really over underinsured? Um, this particular example for Joe policyholder came out that they could probably get their house back and, uh, and furnish it. So they're in pretty good shape. Um, uh, but understanding the person's insurance is really, really critical to knowing if they can afford to rebuild because some people are underinsured. You have to really be careful of that. And then after it's all over, you want to go through and write these case studies and really evaluate how well did you do. For example, the houses in the HOA areas, they might be completely rebuilt because you had the support of the HOA and they all had to go in together because they have design rules and stuff like that. Uh, workforce housing where things are really close together, but there's no HOA still did pretty well. Custom flat areas, not as well. And then everyone else out in the rural area, much harder to rebuild because you don't have that community drive together and everyone's on a different schedule. So really something to be aware of uh, how the house is situated and, and the likelihood of getting it rebuilt faster and how can you help the people in the everything, everyone else category rebuild. The typical everyone else is, you know, 25% rebuilt at five years. Uh, these are the figures we got at three years. We, we were actually more like uh, 85 to 95% in the 95% in the HOA, 85 to 90% in the workforce housing. And, uh, and that's phenomenal. And that's what you want to look for. How can you get that kind of a result? Because you're really in a race to keep people from losing hope. And then we have some case studies if you want to see them. And I just want to quickly flip over to... Um, to uh, the Santa Cruz one here. This is uh, from the Santa Cruz. This is one of their workshops. And then um, this, is, uh, this is how they advertised uh, their uh, Zoom calls. And you could go on their website and sign up to, to meet with an architect and have an online meeting. And I thought that that was really a good way of reacting during COVID um, and, and uh, not having to rent a hall. And it, it has changed how things are um, so, so those were those were just some examples I wanted to give. I hope that's been helpful, and I'm going to stop sharing now. Thanks. 
Well, that's a lot to throw at us. And uh, the good news is somebody's already done this. Um, so we aren't having to reinvent the wheel. Um, super helpful, Julia, really appreciate that. Um, before we get to questions and, and feedback from the audience, we've already got a few populated in the Q&A in the chat. Um, Kevin, based on what you've heard from, from the folks up in Boulder County and what you've heard from Julia and what you know about AIA, of course, you've been involved for quite a while here in the local chapter. Um, where do you see us going um, both as a profession and as individual stakeholders in this process working with, um, with clients and, and government agencies, which is something your, your firm does all the time? Yeah, you, you know, I was, I've been very encouraged by what I've heard so far today. I mean, Dale, Ron, and, and Kim's um, update on what they've been doing just in the short two weeks after this, uh, you know, tremendous disaster it has been really impressive. The assessment that Kim was discussing, um, a very common uh, approach where we need to get out and understand what the actual conditions are on the ground. The fact that you guys were able to assess the whole uh, situation in just a matter of days is really impressive. Um, and then Julia's uh, PowerPoint there, tremendously helpful. I, I even took a few notes, you know, some things that maybe I, I want to follow up with. Uh, but I guess my only kind of my only few comments here that I could add um, is the you know the role of the architect in disaster relief. We we see it playing pretty strongly in all of those stages that Julia mentioned, um, where most of our experiences and my, my personal experience in the the immediate uh, response, we find that architects joining teams of uh, environmental uh, assessors and, and structural assessors and, and power and water, wastewater, where an architect can really come in, you know, with that general building sense and, and be able to evaluate structures pretty rapidly uh, is very important. Um, the other part that uh, I think architects bring to response situations is that um, we have an ability to project manage. And so in our company, we have staged teams around the country that are typically led by architects uh, for that very reason, so that when they need to deploy to various uh, disasters around the country, they could do so pretty quickly. Um, but then uh, Julia covered the recovery period very, very well. The, I think the other area where we see architects playing a pretty big role is in the mitigation and preparedness section, um, where you know our community involvement, uh, getting involved in our in our local communities, talking about resiliency, talking about how do we prepare. Uh, just our, our communities and our neighborhoods to prevent these types of disasters in the future and learn from these situations. Um, you know, an architect, again, knowledge of the built environment can really bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, leadership to those situations as well. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate your perspective. Um, let's get to some questions here and i'm, I'm going to preview a couple items uh, we'll, we'll close out by letting you know of future opportunities for for more of this kind of conversation but we're also going to do a poll so watch for that survey question here that comes up in in the zoom panel about how ways in which you might want to get involved uh, and then i think what i'll do is for the last word or the last feedback is we'll go back to our folks in boulder county after we've gone through some q a and and reacting to um, some of the things that other chapters have done and ask you folks, what would be most helpful to you? So I'm giving you a, um, uh, I guess a little bit of an advanced warning to start um, turning your, your wheels and your brains on that one. Uh, let's see, okay, some questions from the audience and, and Nick's here to, uh, to help facilitate some of these questions as well. Um, Rosie asks, is there a way the AI could help facilitate the collaborations between architects regularly throughout the rebuilding process so we could perhaps have a periodic Zoom to share experiences, ask questions, et cetera, to better serve our clients rather than working in isolation. Um, who would like to take that one? Nick or Brenda or me? <laughs> you know, we, we definitely want to be part of a two-way collaboration process. So like, just like we're doing what we're doing right now, we wanna make sure that our members know what's, you know, what does Boulder County know? Uh, we want to share that. We also want to make sure that uh, Boulder County knows and the local jurisdictions within that, that we are a resource, that we have members that are willing to step up and that we do hope to get involved. So we, we definitely plan on being a continued, uh, having continued involvement uh, in both directions and uh, helping out members and helping out the, the local governments. Yeah, we have a brand new, um, and this is just you know, minimum required standards, basically. We've got a brand new resource page that we've assembled uh, on our website, aicolorado.org, um, where 
anybody can access that information. But I think uh, what you're talking about with the question is something a little bit more proactive where folks get together on a regular basis to, um, you know, swap some some more stories, so to speak, and and really stay on top of things, help each other hold up well and and give their best advice to the clients um, without being in conflict with what the local governments are requiring or what the insurance companies are, are willing to play, pay for. So, I mean, we've gotten plenty of examples of that from Julia. And so we're going to be sure to add that to our resource page and, and maybe stand up a group. Um, if this sounds good to you, watch for the survey coming in a few minutes to say, I want to do that. Sarah asks, where is the chart on the wave of when permits will go in? Oh, I think I, I would have to answer that. Um, uh, there are a lot of charts out there. Uh, I would have to look that up and, and get back to you. But in general, uh, you know, you have to clean the debris first and then you have to design and plan. So you have to find your old plans. You have to work with your insurance a little bit. I mean, I lost my house last year and it took me three months of arguing with the insurance before I started rebuilding myself. Um, so, so there, you know, the first three, four months, there's not really many permits submitted. So uh, uh, then it starts to ramp up slowly, you know, and, and then, then it'll top out. Uh, it depends on the insurance uh, window. So in California, our window is now three years. It used to be one if you weren't in a declared disaster and two if you were. And we got it extended to three years. So, so the, the rental that you're in uh, extends to three years. And, um, and so you have a little more time. So it really depends on that, that window that you have with the, the insurance. Uh, so it will take some time to hire your architect or for your contractor to, to, to hire an architect to do design or a designer. Obviously, uh, people don't really have to be licensed in Colorado uh, for ordinary houses. But um, but it, it, will, it will take some time to ramp that up before you're ready to submit to permit. And uh, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, obviously in Colorado, there's also the, the weather factor. So all the permits, you know, I always designed my houses and, and got them in permit. I always was most busy in December. So uh, people wanted their permit by uh, April 1st, May 1st at the latest so that they could have their foundation and ground before snow flew in the winter. So, you know, you have to think about it in that term. Uh, when are people savvy enough at this moment if they've never rebuilt that they need to, to fit that window? Um, uh, so, so that's something I would be looking at uh, in terms of the wave is gonna be different for our snow country. And Kim, you mentioned early on that it's it's not everybody goes into one bucket and, and hopefully, you know, we, we get the, we get an early number at the at the bakery counter and, and wait for our name to be called. It's there's there's a parallel process that work continues, but we've also got a dedicated path for folks who are affected in this disaster, right? That's exactly right. So I do want to reiterate that because I saw that come up in the question box as well. I mean, we do have a fairly significant wait for just our typical processes um, right now in unincorporated Boulder County, as Stephen uh, Sparn pointed out. Um, we do plan on handling this subset of folks that are impacted by the fire separate from that list of, of people that are, are currently on our pre-application wait list. So we won't be asking people to sign up for the regular processes for pre-apps. You know, we'll be exploring and, and interested in hearing ideas from this group about, you know, maybe we could have some sort of group pre-application conference um, session, maybe we can, you know, dedicate certain office hours to have these kinds of um, meetings. So things like that, I think, are what we're exploring currently. The other thing I would like to um, just hit on briefly is um, I think it was really helpful in Julia's slides to show the different phases of response versus recovery. I just want to reiterate that we are still in the transition between response and recovery right now. So while a lot of you are thinking about things and, and people may be calling their architects, it's like there's a lot of people that just want to have some sort of action taken right now because you're in a really helpless position and you want to feel like you're making some progress. And I guess I would just um, sort of throw out there that it's okay to, to sort of take a pause and know that a lot of things are getting developed. We still want to be able to help people, but that may not, that may not mean 
getting a permit issued for a rebuild right this right this moment. So there's a lot of things to figure out. Um, the very first on the list is is looking at cleanup and debris removal. There's a lot of information that was shared yesterday and you know in the previous days about how that program will work. And we're having a community meeting next week um, to to go over some of that information. And and really while you can begin thinking about what you want to rebuild, um, you know a lot of it's going to be dictated by insurance settlements, those sorts of things, and, and a lot of details that really need to be worked out right now. Yeah, I, I think you're onto something with the, instead of doing, you know, onesie twosie meetings, you know, which are going to be impossible to schedule and take, extend that calendar really far out. You do might be an equivalent of a pre-bid meeting, but a, a pre-permitting meeting, you know, where all the interested parties are together and we kind of answer the frequently asked questions that everybody has. Yeah, there's certainly some economies of scale, I think, that would help us be more efficient um, in responding to this particular community. Yeah, I think you also need to understand, they think, don't hold us up on our permits, but they have they don't know what pre-construction is. So they don't know about geotechs. They don't know about uh, septic uh, testing uh, after a wildfire or making sure the water lines still work or the checking the well. All those things take a lot of time because everyone's super busy. So understanding there's a pre-construction process and there's a cost to that, that insurance usually doesn't even know how to assess, but it, it should be paid for by the insurance. Um, that, that's a whole package of services that has to happen before you get a permit. And uh, people need to understand that. So pre-app meetings for a group of people would be far more productive so that they can start to understand the process of re rebuilding. Related question from Stephen is, does the county know if they'll receive additional funds from state or federal sources for staffing resources to process the permits? Um, I know it's not a fast process even before the fire. And you may not know that yet. But. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I, what we know so far is in pest disasters, uh, we generally don't get state or federal funds for private reconstruction for us staff, for staffing purposes. Um, we do have our permit fees, which are covered by insurance and rebuilding. And so what I hope, and I'm very interested in these, these rebuilding curves that, that Julia mentioned, um, so we can anticipate some of the revenue and try to understand what staff and when we would need to bring them on. Because, yeah, we don't want to step up now, use all our money that we think we might get and have them sitting around and not doing anything. So I think, you know, these conversations are really helpful for us to, to get to get at um, that issue, but generally there's not there's not money that goes from the state to us to perform these sorts of tasks. So we'll, we'll have to a, figure it's it out. It's a cash flow exercise that you can pencil out because it has a built-in revenue stream, yeah. but it's yeah. all a matter of timing and how that surge you know starts and ends. And and then in today's world of us being able to bring on the staff at that point in time, um, it's it's a really tight labor market as you all know and we are having trouble hiring people in, in these different fields at the moment. So um, the more we can anticipate and understand, hopefully the better prepared we can be so that um, we are in a position to be able to, to do this. And um, as I think we've heard, it's we're, we're one small step in all this. And so I, I really did appreciate Julia's presentation of all the different parts of rebuilding. And one, one ask I have of all of you as we leave is that, that you help set the expectations for your clients and the people you're hearing from too about the timing um, and that we work together on that um, expectation setting because I think that's really important as we move forward. I kind of addressed this earlier. Paul asked, is there gonna be an effort to redesign all electric service to um, the new construction to reduce emissions? There's certainly been uh, discussions about that, but uh, you know, again, we, this is probably not the right time to be layering on new requirements. Um, but the the questions that that I've been uh, talking with folks about uh, in in uh, Louisville and, and Superior, as well as the the, the uh, governor's energy office, uh, or the Colorado Energy Office, rather, um, is whether or not there's funding that can actually incentivize 
some of the upgrades to the basic infrastructure so that, um, for instance, we have electrical panels that are sized for future electrification, even if we don't do it now. Um, the, big, the big pushes are, are thinking about um, the electrification of the, of the home, but also um, things like electric vehicle uh, charging stations and stuff like that, where this might present an opportunity. Um, and we know that you know once you size that main electrical panel, it doesn't typically get uh, get adjusted. So so the question is how do we how do we make sure that we get lay that basic infrastructure uh, now so that so that electrification becomes much easier later. We've got uh, two questions from um, two different people, but they're very similar. So I'm going to read them both, and hopefully the answer will apply to each. Um, Brian says building back better may imply different. Uh, planning and land use concepts than what exists now in the burn areas. Can the county and AIA play a role in advocating for better redevelopment potential instead of just one-to-one -one replacement? And then Wayne says uh, in the chat, understanding recovery is very much still ongoing. To what extent has the recovery effort revealed opportunities that we can improve from, from a built environment or code enforcement standpoint in other areas of the state with similar vulnerabilities? I would say on the planning issue that that came up in our community right away. We had some people wanted to say, don't let anyone rebuild in the in the rural areas and uh, make everyone rebuild in the workforce housing area with triple the density, you know, to keep everybody in town. Uh, but uh, in reality, the insurance only pays for the house. It doesn't pay for the planning and the infrastructure that went into putting that house in that particular place. So. In, uh, in the world of disaster recovery, you can't redo planning at this moment. You may be able to improve energy and sustainability of the structure and resilience. But if you think about uh, things will change over time and you can start thinking about this, but you can't do it now. Because uh, right now these people are facing that they have a certain amount of insurance money to work with and that's it. And it doesn't cover the, those things that are under the ground or, or before building the house. And so if you think about Miami and uh, sea, sea level rise, what are those people gonna do when their water, their house is gonna be completely underwater forever? Uh, we're gonna to have to do transfer development rights after the disaster, after the hurricane that they don't rebuild back in that same area. We're gonna to have to start facing some of that in, in the kind of more mountainous regions, uh, allowing them to, to take the value of their uh, property and put it into a high rise in another area. So transfer development rights will be the future I think of uh, replanning for disaster, but you have to set it up well in advance of the disaster. You can't do it right now. And uh, politicians will be crucified for suggesting that you can. Uh, so, so don't try it. We had one here who got in major hot water and is no longer a politician. Uh, so uh, yeah, be aware that people only have their insurance money to rebuild the structure. They don't really have the money to redo the planning. And just just to add to that, you know, the one of the things that I think makes this event really different from some of the larger fires we've dealt with in the past is that you know th these these took place in you know platted subdivisions that are you know not considered the kinds of places where people have said, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't be building in the in the forest. This wasn't in the forest, um, and that I think makes it really different in terms of how we think about the the land use issues regarding you know whether or not people belong living here. It's it's really that's not the same kind of question that we've seen in, in past events. And some of the damages that are associated with utilities and um, public infrastructure are going to be covered in that um, public assistance bucket where we're identifying, you know, if, if streets need to be torn up, I think this question came up earlier in the, in the chat, but um, if streets need to be torn up because um, we need to reinstall some utilities from the municipalities, this is more an issue for Superior and Louisville than it is for unincorporated, which Dale, um, Ron and I are speaking to, but that all um, happens through the, the city's infrastructure reimbursement. We do have an unincorporated Boulder County um, likely damage OWTS system, so on-site wastewater, which is your septic system, um, perhaps water lines that will need to be looked at, um, but individual property owners will need to, to take a look at those. And there's some guidance on our web pages about that as well. Well, one more um, question. I think, Julie, you can cover this, and it may be in that chart you showed. Um, Sarah asks, is the architecture and permitting fees um, covered by insurance as a cost in addition to their house coverage? Um, 
Absolutely. Uh, what happens, however, is that when insurance companies estimate um, the cost of rebuilding, they just include architect fees as like some minor percentage, like 2% <laughs> in, in their estimate. So you have to educate uh, the insurance adjusters and it's a one-off basis. You know, some, some projects can be re redone for very little money. It's just a new set of plans with the energy and uh, structural upgrades that are required by the new code. And uh, other projects, they, they're completely redesigned and they could spend $200,000. But I've had some clients who spent $200,000 and then they weren't able to build their house. So it, it's really something you have to be very careful about. Um, you can't go overboard, but it's not 2%. So uh, the pre-construction costs of geotech, septic, uh, uh, energy and engineering, all those things have to be paid for upfront and they should be reasonable. Um, amounts, uh, but not 2%. So the, the estimating things that they use through the insurance actually really devalues the architect, which is what got my blood boiling in the first place, um, because uh, this is the one time that architects can actually charge a normal fee for their services and not be worried that the owner can't pay it um, or, or that it's not important. You, you should get a reasonable amount for your, for your services and uh, you're in high demand right now. So um, you don't have to work for free and you don't have to do uh, uh, bottom of the barrel uh, quality of work. You want to do the best, fastest work. That's that's what architects most need to be able to do is provide fast drawings and fast design. And you have a, another workload already in place before this happened. So uh, you got to be really careful about your time and uh, they should be able to get their, their pre-construction services reimbursed for sure. But you have to build that, they have to build it into their budget, so. If I can just uh, add to one, and this is down in the weeds a little bit, but uh, but Julia mentioned geotech reports, and I, I just want to just trying to make sure we, the word gets out about this. So one of the things that has become clear is that many of the homes that were destroyed were built on soils where the uh, the original soils reports. Um, analyzed for bearing capacity, but they did not look into swelling soils issues at that time. That didn't happen until uh, the mid to late 90s. And so this, those earlier soils reports just looked at bearing. And uh, we know for a fact that many of those areas, in fact, do have severe swelling soils and that came apart, like they came to light during a, a, a large series of lawsuits about that. But just, just to make sure uh, people hear about that, that when they're looking at those old reports, make sure that we're not just looking at bearing capacity, but also evaluating for uh, swelling soil potential. Well, speaking also, of I, would, I would add to that one more thing is that if you have a community with 150 homes or uh, we had one with 1300 homes, uh, they did their, their geotech together and everyone just paid a small part. So it became much more affordable for everybody. Um, and the building department was willing to accept that if, the, if they were all right together and the geotech accepted doing it and then everybody paid a smaller fee. It was really quite, quite effective for getting it done quickly. I'm actually setting up a meeting right now with some, uh, some civil engineers um, to lay out a plan for how we, how we approach that with both unincorporated areas, but also uh, with Superior and Louisville. Well, I know we've all got um, time limitations as well, so I want to respect that and also acknowledge that this is not the this may be the first, but it's certainly not the last conversation we're going to have on this uh, topic in this particular area. So I want to get back to what I had said earlier and, and let our folks from Boulder County um, give us a response on what they've heard today that's encouraging or that they'd like to hear more from us and our members about. But before we do that, just some, some housekeeping notes. I know we've got more questions um, and comments in the chat. We're gonna have a follow-up email that goes to all uh, participants today uh, to give you those links and resources we talked about. In the chat, you'll find the survey monkey tool on architecture relief for the wildfire. So if you, if you have any interest in continuing this conversation and being part of it, please fill that out. Uh, and then in two weeks from today, we've got our next webinar on the same topic. We've got a different lineup of speakers uh, with a little bit different approach uh, to the subject matter, uh, but going, uh, going deeper into this conversation. And then if you're really wanting to get involved in the assessments and want to be somebody that, that Kim has on her speed dial after the next one of these, uh, we're going to have uh, safety assessment protocol training SAP from uh, the California um, Office of Emergency Services. It's sort of the uh, nationwide standard for 
for being credentialed and doing these uh, assessments after disaster. Uh, that's a date to be determined in May. So um, lots more opportunities to get involved. Um, and of course, um, what I'm hearing is there's, there's four elements, essentially. There's a consumer outreach element that we can organize uh, on behalf of AIA, uh, maybe with some an assist uh, in a sense from the local jurisdiction saying that we, we sort of we're, we're hosting this, but we're not providing the content. Um, so we can lean on each other's uh, credibility. Um, feedback and sounding board uh, to those folks at the local level where we maybe put a, a small group of expert architects together that they can bounce ideas off of rather than, than dealing with them one at a time or, or just having a, a, a more generalized group response. Um, you know, what, what would you think of, of us doing this process or implementing this policy or, or changing this procedure? Uh, just a small handful of architects who are in, in this uh, single family residential field that, that can tell you really quickly, I think that would be good, or you should think about this instead. Um, then of course the big nut is gonna be design services. You know, there's gonna be huge demand for people who are already quite busy. Um, so how can we identify the folks that are willing to, to be um, of service to these clients and then finally, the local government support is going to be a big one. You know, as you mentioned, um, there, there's, you know, there's no magic pot of money coming from the federal or state government to suddenly staff up these folks. And there's not even a ready pool of labor that's on the sidelines just waiting to be called and put into place. So is there something we can learn from other uh, parts of the country who have dealt with this? We've seen examples where um, uh, licensed professionals have done it, on, you know, almost on a contractual basis. Uh, you know, that they would obviously have no involvement in that project other than working for the local government to help um, keep things moving through the planning and permitting and inspection process. So those are four things we're going to explore a little bit deeper um, as an organization. And um, the, the bonus one is advocacy. Um, we know that there's some federal funding that is available for, for um, adaptation, for rebuilding, for mitigation. Um, and right now, Colorado cannot get those FEMA grants because we have no statewide building code in place. Um, and so we're going to work on that in this legislative session. Um, it's going to be a tough hill to climb, but um, if there's any example of why we need it, we've just seen it. So um, Julia, Kevin, Nicholas, thanks for your participation today. Um, we're going to end with Ron and Kimberly and Dale um, with the last word. I guess I'll just kick it off by just saying how much I appreciate all of the uh, the folks who have who have reached out uh, um, to to offer support for the for these folks. People are people are in uh, you know traumatized, and uh, it's really um, it's really inspiring to see how many people uh, in the in, as design professionals have stepped up to try and and help people out and and provide guidance. So uh, I just I, I really appreciate that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I really want to hear as we move forward into this, um, I want to hear from folks to understand what, what they're running into in terms of, of the problems um, with, with, uh, with moving forward. And so we can really identify where we need to put our attention in, 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 uh, in this recovery process. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. I, I posted in the chat a um, link to Boulder County's Article 19 procedures following a disaster. So that is something that we've had in place for several years, um, knowing what things we needed to kind of have pre-set up for anticipation of any disasters and, and how we've sort of historically handled um, rebuilding with other events, fires, flood, um, et cetera, is by having a, a special set of provisions that apply to the um, folks that will be rebuilding. I think that's, again, what we're exploring there. So I would encourage people to take a look at those Article 19 regulations. If you've had um, experience with Calwood rebuilding or Four Mile Fire rebuilding, we are looking to do this better. So um, appreciate your ideas. And I echo Ron's um, thank you and gratitude to this community for holding this forum with us. Um, we really do hope to partner with you and, um, and have your support. We're gonna need it. This is a, a big scale event and um, we need to be working together, not um, 
not adversarially. We have great relationships with many of you and we hope to, to really um, leverage those and um, really help each other make this a smooth process for the people that are impacted. Um, one last thing that I just have to say is that I mentioned that we had done about 27, 2700 inspections. That number, I actually got the update. That was after the first day. So in whole, we did 8,258 inspections within a matter of days. And that was looking at the damage and destroyed structures, the debris accounts, and the assessor's record. So just a, a really incredible effort. Um, so might be an indication of just how much work has um, been taking place over this past you know, week and a half. What are we, two weeks now? <laughs> Lost talk of time. But anyway, in short, thank you. Yeah, and you're still awake and alert and, and looking somewhat well rested after all that. <laughs> I took a shower today for this. <laughs> We're glad we could provide that excuse for you. Okay, Dale, bring us home. All right. Uh, well, the good thing about having such great people working for me is I they, they cover everything. So there's not much left to cover. Um, I, I share the same thanks to all of you for being here, for being involved, having 50 people so interested in trying to figure out how to how to assist the community is is it's it's heartwarming to see and to work together in a collaborative fashion. I think the one thing that, that maybe we can help clarify too, or maybe put a little bit of ease on is this disaster, it, it appears different. We're still doing the analysis. I can't promise anything, but in the past disasters, after the flood, after Four Mile Canyon fire, even after the Calwood fire, we were worried about the disaster after the disaster, the debris flows, the mudslides, those sorts of issues were there. Um, and so we had to put in a planning process in order for folks to be able to rebuild. So there was a, a short process that we, we designed to address those really hazard issues, mainly in those, those, those situations. In this case, we're looking and seeing, and we're not seeing that there's that potential, there's much potential for the disaster after the disaster. So if people are going to be rebuilding what they previously had in the same location, those things may be able to move quickly to building permit stage without having to for, for us to ramp up both on the planning review side and on the building side. Um, so I'm, that's, that's my ray of hope that I've got out there, um, but we're still doing that analysis um, as we move forward and we'll, we'll look at that. But again, just looking forward to working with all of you as we move forward um, and collaborate and figure out how we can help the, those impacted by this. Thanks. Well, I can promise you we'll be back in touch with, with that assistance, and I can make that promise because we've got so many good people who are willing to step up and, and do that. So um, appreciate everybody's time today, whether you're a participant that just wants to know more, or you're, you're just anxious to be of service, um, or you're one of our panelists. Um, for all of you, thank you so much, and um, we wish you well, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>